I can see a lot of folks joining. So we're gonna give folks just one minute before we get started. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to the EC Data Works uh, webinar on using census data to support early childhood integrated data systems. We have a wonderful panelist scheduled for everybody this afternoon to learn a little bit more about how states have both been using this data and what the future it looks like for how we can better use this information or inform the national conversations about using early childhood data um, with the census. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So excited to have you all here. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. So we really pulled this together because we were having lots of states come together and start asking questions um, really about the census, both with limitations as well as how we can better pull it in for the use of the current early childhood integrated data system conversation. We're also been learning a lot about what the census is actually trying to do to actually improve the data quality. So there's also an opportunity today to learn a little bit more about what we can be doing as a community of folks really diving into this early childhood integrated data system conversation to inform what's happening nationally. So we both want to understand those challenges and opportunities. Uh, we know that it's we often on webinars get to hear about the things that are working really well. I've also encouraged the panelists today to share what they've learned and the challenges along the way because we know that's also very informative. We also want to discover the tools. And so we've asked uh, some folks who are both in the process of creating tools and informing tools from the census to share what they are doing and what these tools could look like. And we've also, the states that are joining us today have used the census in their tools. And so hopefully we'll give you a good example of what the potential is. And again, what some of the limitations are currently in this work. Uh, many of you we recognize may be new to the early childhood integrated data system conversation. Many of you may have been, you know, been very familiar and been part of this conversation for the last decade. So we just want to take a minute to make sure that we all understand what we mean when we say early childhood integrated data systems. This is a slide that we have used for a long term and is defined from 2014 by a handful of states that came together and said, hey, what are the commonalities? Knowing that no one ECIDS is the same, what are the similarities? And so as you can see from this definition, it's really when we are integrating, collecting, storing this data together to inform early childhood programs. It really, some states are going zero to five, some are going truly the early childhood development ages, which is zero to eight. So it depends again on the ECIDS, but at least birth to five, birth to eight has been the, the consistency there or kind of the consistent theme across states. And then finally, it's the type of data that are collected. So it includes the child, the family, the program, the classroom data across all of the programs. And so that is the thing to know is that um, it really needs to be kind of two or more is kind of the definition we're often looking for, knowing that no one state right now has all of these programs in the rainbow into the, in their ECIDS. But our hope is that eventually all the data will be in there because this is what we know is truly needed to inform the early childhood comprehensive systems building conversations in a state. So with that, uh, that is our hope. That's what we're talking about when we say early childhood integrated data system. And you're gonna see some examples of those systems today. But what we also know and have recognized since the beginning of these conversations is that often what states are being asked for are the, the counts of children in a state. That is kind of a preliminary question being asked. So it's how many children and families are fill in the blank. Often it's being asked for, you know, typical geographic region, depending on who's asking the question, that even geography may change. Uh, we know who, who might be eligible for services, how many kids live in a certain region, what age groups might be eligible for program expansion purposes. And now we're starting to get into more things like the workforce. So now we're even being asked questions about what does the workforce look like, which we know really impacts um, the programs that we're serving and the workforce shortages we're currently experiencing. 
But we also know that the census really is using this aggregate data. And what we also recognize from the recent census data is that there's a lot of undercounting happens. So we're really thrilled to have some folks today that are going to join and talk about what that undercount looks like and what that means for some of the work that we're doing as well. So with that, I want to briefly introduce today's panelists. I'm really thrilled to have some experts from the field joining us today to really kind of take this from a couple different perspectives. Um, Minnesota's Department of Education will be Jen is presenting on behalf of them and their team has really worked to integrate in all of the components of the census data, not just Minnesota's, but everybody's. And so there's an opportunity for other states who are looking to just to say what that looks like, how has that been used? Um, Nebraska is gonna show their tool and how they've actually used some of the census data and the, the kind of caveats they put around their data and their tools. Um, 3SI is gonna present a public tool that they are working on creating and, and be able to present some of that initial version of what that looks like for states. And then UVA's team led by Joe is really going to be here today to talk about some of what their work with census and what that has been looking like and where the future uh, work is going and some of these limitations. So again, really thrilled to have everybody here. Thank you to our presenters for making time and sharing your experience. We really appreciate it. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Jen. All right. Thank you, Missy. All right. Hi, everybody. So I am Jen Verbrugge, and I have the honor of overseeing the work of the Early Childhood Longitudinal Data System uh, for the state of Minnesota. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit, I'll give you a little bit of background about um, ECLDS, as we affectionately call it. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the census data that we've been able to uh, include on our website for your use, as Missy mentioned, um, and also for our use as well, to demonstrate how we have been able to include that into a report that we hope has been helpful to users. So what is ECLDS? Um, so we actually in Minnesota have one of the older uh, early childhood integrated data systems. Our ECLDS launched at the beginning of 2016. So we're coming on almost eight years that uh, we've been around. Um, and it's an integrated data tool that links data from three state agencies. So the Department of Education, where I am stationed, as well as the Department of Human Services and our separate Department of Health. Um, and we also have a couple of other partner programs as well, but those are our main partners in the data. So our data are linked at the child level, and then they are de-identified, and then we put them out in public reports um, in groups. And you can disaggregate um, according uh, to some various filters that we have in each of the reports so that you can get closer looks at smaller groups of kids that have common experiences or common characteristics. Um, and so our primary users for our ECLDS seem to be people who are doing local and state planning for early care and education programs. And oftentimes those programs need to do some sort of a community needs assessment. And so we have found that the ECLDS has been useful for that. Um, and then we were finding ways to make it more useful by including census data. So this kind of ugly slide is actually our data source matrix. This is really just the list of the different data sources that we have in the ECLDS. I don't know if you can see it very well. You can access this on our website um, if you wanted to go and take a look at it. Um, but we do have a lot of data sources from our Department of Human Services, quite a few also from the Department of Education, a couple from our Department of Health, and then we also have partners in our Office of Higher Education, our uh, State Teacher Licensing Board, as as well as one um, public health partner uh, who is a, that is a county. Uh, and hopefully we'll expand that sometime, but they are our only family home visiting partner at this time. So the ECLDS was built to answer two very, very broad policy questions. What do we know about the kids who participate in our state's public early care and education programs? And then what do we know about those kids after they have participated in our public early care and education programs? So for the first question, we're really looking at demographics, um, the different program combinations that families use. And for the second question, we're really looking at third grade outcomes. So third grade attendance, um, third grade test scores, and also their continued special education use or new special education use. So those are the primary things that we look at. Now, this is also kind of an ugly slide, but this is actually ugly intentionally so that you can see um, in terms of categorical eligibility, how these very 
at these different programs sort of interplay with each other. So categorical eligibility is um, the eligibility of a family. If they have applied for and qualified for one program, they may qualify to take part in, like automatically qualify to take part in other programs. And so these uh, two diagrams are sort of demonstrating how they interplay. And it's very complex and it's very hard for families to understand. It's very hard for us to understand. Um, it's just, and I'm sure that that your state has a very similar sort of complex sort of interplay of the different early care and education programs that you provide. One of the programs um, in particular that we had an interest in working with uh, was Head Start and Early Head Start. And um, they were very reluctant to share their data with our longitudinal data system um, for a number of reasons. And so in an effort to try to woo them over in, onto the ECLDS side, um, we were trying to find ways that we could just help them find some of the data that they need. And one of those things that they needed um, more detailed information about uh, children under the age of six um, was for their community assessment. And so we just needed to help them find more detailed information about babies, toddlers, and preschoolers in Minnesota, as well as their families. Um, and what better to look place to look than the American Community Survey through the U.S. Census Bureau, right? This is really the premier um, source of data that we have. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's the best um, data source that we have for information about kids under the age of six. However, as you can see on this slide, um, the data made available through the ACS website is only shared in that one lump grouping of under five years, which does not tell us much about the babies, toddlers, and preschoolers that are part of that lumped group. Uh, and so we worked with partners at the Census Bureau to try to find a way that we could get some more detailed information. Of course, we were hoping to get um, information at each of the ages. So we'd want to know as much as we could about the kids who are one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, etc. Um, that data, while they do have it, is not made available really to anybody. Um, and so we sort of compromised on getting data about these different age bands instead. So we have babies, uh, which is birth to one year, toddlers, two to three years, and then preschoolers, which is four to five years. Um, and so we were able to buy some tables from the Census Bureau that had this more um, sp sort of specific data in them. And the, our friends at the Census Bureau said, hey, if we're gonna make these tables for you for Minnesota, we might as well do it for all of the states. And so we said, yes. Um, and so we bought this data for everybody. Um, so we have uh, data up for almost every county, except for the super tiny ones in every state um, available on our website. So this is um, what our tool looks like that you are able to go and you don't need a username or password. Anybody can hop on this and download the data for their particular county or state of interest. Um, and I do wanna say that I know it looks kind of boring and blah. There is a lot of data in here, lots of information. These tables are really big and this is a really slow tool. So if you go in there, please be patient and just let it load. Um, you just follow the drop downs from the top on down and then you can um, um, pull out a table of data um, for whatever it is that you're looking for. These are the different topics that we have available. So there are 30 different topics um, and they all uh, really were uh, picked with the Head Start community needs assessment in mind, but are useful, we think, to many other people who are doing community needs ass assessments or just wanting to get more information about their particular area. So we put together a couple of use case ideas um, for how you might um, want to use this. So say you are a school district and you're interested in working with your area county or counties about ways to better connect with people who in your area who are not fully insured. How do you know who those people are? Uh, well, we can get that information for you um, through our census tool. Um, you just make your choices. You can choose household or insurance coverage status, download as an Excel, Excel file and here you go. These are the results for Ramsey County, which is where I live, um, for people who have no health insurance coverage and those who do have health insurance coverage. You can see in this table that it's broken down by birth to five years, 
zero to one year, two to three years, and four to five years. So you have those individual counts for the different age groups that you might need. And then if you were that school district, you could continue planning with your local health organization. Say, I know that we have all of these families that could use extra supports. Help me try to find them. Uh, of course, we don't have names and addresses here, but at least we have an idea of how many people could use that extra help. And, of, and also, of course, community assessments is a very strong use case for our ECLDS data and the census data that's included there. Uh, so Head Start programs, as you might know, have to do a community assessment every five years for their federal grant funding. And there are some very specific things that are listed that they need to include. Um, those are listed in the Head Start program performance standards, talking about infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, we need the counts of each of those, which we can now get thanks to these tables from the ACS. Um, and then we also have information about health, nutrition, and social service needs, as well as typical work, school, and training schedules of parents. So those are all things that you can get out of our report. Um, okay, so this is what you could use it for. I'm going to demonstrate what we ended up using it for. So bear with me just a moment, please. I'm going to quit out of there and then go into here. This is the ECLDS website. I hope you can see it. If you click on birth to pre-K reports and go into community assessment, that's going to pop open this report, which is called our community assessment report. And what we ended up doing was pulling those census tables from Minnesota into this report. So this could be a one stop location for our Head Start partners to go to get almost all of the data that they need for their, their community assessment. Um, and so if you click in here, I'm just going to choose county, and then I'll go back, I'll go down to Ramsey County just to demonstrate this. And then you can choose different fiscal years. Any of the census data that we have um, is in the five-year increment. So we have 2010, 2015, and 2020. I'm going to choose 2020. And you can see we have a number of census um, topics that are included in here um, that we can get information about. So I'm just going to choose children in the area, run the report. And then you can see that we have these counts for birth to five-year-olds in total, and then also birth to one-year-olds, two to three-year-olds, and four to five-year-olds. So this is just one way that we have taken the data that we were able to purchase from the Census Bureau and include it into our report. And this is the only place we've done this so far. We did just hire a research scientist. She's gonna start in a couple of weeks, um, who I hope is going to take where we have started with this and just really run with it and find other ways that we can use that uh, more detailed census information in some of our other reports to really inform our users and maybe pick up additional new users of our website because we're offering these great new reports and services. All right, I'm gonna hop back over. Okay, so this is our community assessment report that I just showed you. These are some examples of some results that we have in there. And that is um, where I'm gonna end today. All right, um, I think we're gonna take questions later. So, and now I'm just gonna pass it over to Jared. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Jen. So I'm going to go ahead and get my screen sharing here. One second. Okay, you all seeing that? Perfect. Okay. So, um, yeah, my name is Jared Stevens. I'm on the Nebraska eKids team, uh, Nebraska Early Childhood Integrated Data System. We call our system eKids in Nebraska. Um, that's just what we decided to go with. So you'll hear me say those words a lot during this presentation. Um, I'm going to spend a few times going through some slides just discussing why we're using census data within our tool, uh, who our eKids dashboard is for, and a few of the lessons that we learned throughout the process. Uh, and then I'll get into an actual demonstration of, of our dashboard and the use of, of census data. I didn't prepare much of an overview for our eKids um, just because I wanted to make sure that I had time for the demo, um, but, but some of it will come out kind of naturally within the, the presentation and the demo. All right. So... Move here. All right. So why why use census data? So from a general perspective, uh, census data helps us provide population level estimates 
that help us support decisions in early childhood related to program expansion, outreach, and allocation of resources. And so estimates like the number of children by age, uh, number of children by age, uh, race and ethnicity, by poverty level, are really, really helpful for these purposes. And in a lot of our outreach uh, that we did, we found that some information that's needed by stakeholders, uh, for example, data that's needed for, for community profiles or community assessment work, might actually require combining data from, from multiple state agencies, as well as data from external sources. And so if you know, we only relied on our program participation data and our other state data sources, we would really have a skewed picture of what's actually happening within our state if we, if we only relied on that data. And so data from the US Census can really help us fill in these critical gaps in our state administrative data to help us just create a much more complete picture of the data to help us you know, better understand what's going on in early childhood within our state. So who is our dashboard for? Uh, our eKids dashboard has a broad range of audiences, uh, including program administrators and staff, uh, community-based organizations and staff, our policy and decision makers and legislators, as well as researchers and evaluators. Um, one thing that we really, you know, we learned throughout the process is that it's really important to work with your targeted audiences to ensure that the data and, and the dashboard and the tool that you're creating is actually useful for them. And really the goal of our dashboard is to be able to provide the specific and targeted data that, that our stakeholders need and use for things like administrative reporting and, and other reporting efforts. So a few lessons learned um, throughout the process here. So we did uh, choose a dashboard as the format of our tool, as it really just gives users you know, high level of flexibility to be able to get in there, play around with the data and explore it themselves and gain insights into the data that they're most interested in. We did consistently hear from our stakeholders that they wanted uh, kind of like a one-stop shop for all this data that they needed. And they don't have to you know, go to multiple different websites, go to the census website, go to the DHHS website, all the different websites to be able to get the data that they need. Um, however, we, we also realized this format might not work for everyone. And so in the future, we do hope to work with our stakeholders to create things like you know, targeted, standardized, or automated reports on the data that they're most interested in and, and the data that they use most frequently. Uh, the next lesson learned is that if the intended audience includes staff from agencies contributing data to the eKids, uh, sharing data and working really closely with them just to understand, you know, everything that they, they want to see out of the tool will really show them the value of integrating their data. So if you get in there and you show them in the dashboard, you know, where their data is integrated and how it um, kind of lends itself to the bigger picture, um, that just generates a lot of buy-in and, and really helps keep them engaged throughout the entire process. And it, it really makes it useful for those stakeholders. And then finally, uh, training and close collaboration with uh, key champion stakeholders, as we call them in Nebraska, is essential for achieving widespread utilization of the dashboard and tool. So helping users understand exactly how to use the dashboard, understanding the full functionality, the filters, all the things that are available. Um, for example, doing trainings like how to use census data or um, doing trainings on understanding what the distinct count means and other numbers and visualizations on the dashboard will really just ensure that your, your tool is used by stakeholders and is really useful for them. All right, so I'm gonna spend some time now um, going through our eKids dashboard. So one second here, I'm gonna shift over, make it full screen here. Are you all seeing the dashboard now? Good, okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna spend some time going through the first two pages of our eKids data dashboard, which incorporates the use of, of census data. So this dashboard is based uh, is built on EC DataWorks Easy Framework, which captures the key components of service delivery and participation in early childhood using four categories, eligibility, access, services, and impact. And so of those two, of those, we have two eligibility pages appearing on our dashboard. So that's eligibility child populations and eligibility population indicators. And then we also have a page for access and a page for services. I'll just be demoing the first two pages as that's what's relevant for, for this presentation here. All right, so this first page here, child population, pulls in census data to help us estimate the need for early childhood services within a specific geographic area. So basically, on this page, we wanted to provide data on all the relevant indicators for our stakeholders and those doing community assessment work. And we tried to incorporate the data uh, that's related to eligibility that they're most interested in. And so, um, as you'll see, uh, this nice map of Nebraska on the left hand side, and then we have some different filters of our data here. The first filter is, is our years of data. 
Uh, currently, we do just have 2021 census data, but in the future, we do hope to build in additional years of, of, of census data and almost create like a catalog of years to see how this data is changing over time. We also have a filter for our various geographic slices. Um, and, and right now we have built in the ability to display the data by congressional district, by county, by legislative district, and by school district. One thing that's nice about this is that we also have the ability to use a control plus click to be able to select multiple geographies. And so sometimes for service areas for particular organizations, uh, Head Start is a really good example of this. Uh, their service areas might encompass multiple counties or communities. And so this control plus click allows them to get the data that they need for their exact geographic area that they're interested in. Um, we, we also realize that, you know, maybe there's some other other types of um, geographic slices that, that our stakeholders may be interested in. Uh, for example, would getting down to the granular level of, of, of zip code be, be useful for, for our uh, stakeholders? And so hopefully we, we could add some sort of functionality like that within the future. Um, but basically, you make a selection here. So I'm going to go ahead and type in Lancaster County. That's where Lincoln, Nebraska, where I'm located is. So once I make that selection, it will highlight on the map there that county, um, and then it'll provide uh, down below the data for that county. I did want to point out you can clear out those filters uh, by hitting this little uh, eraser button above there, uh, but I'll go ahead and leave it selected just so we can see this full functionality. So then basically below, um, there's some charts and visual visualizations of, of census data with the full state data on the left, and then that selected geography data appearing on the right-hand side here. So the first card is for the estimated number of children under six. Um, all of this data on this page is provided via the U.S. Census. And so again, that first card is for the estimated children under six. The second one is the uh, estimate for the number of children under six with all available parents in the workforce. Um, obviously, this is a really important indicator for early childhood. And so we've also included the percentage of the total number of kids, because this is a metric that is, that is often reported in community assessment work and that kind of stuff. Uh, the next table is for the percent of children under six by the percentage of federal poverty level. Then we have one for the percentage of children by age and the percentage of children under five by race and ethnicity. I did also want to point out that the Census Bureau table numbers from the census.gov website do appear under each one of the visualizations. Um, so if you just want to get a little bit more information or see that data, um, you, you, can, you can go uh, and, and view that with the table numbers that are included there. And then I wanted to highlight a few other features that, that kind of pertain to the, to the census data. So uh, first, we, we do have a hover over feature that'll provide a little bit more information on the exact numbers. So that'll work on any of the visualizations that appear on our dashboard. So you can do it over the map here. It'll provide the name of the county as well as that those estimate of the numbers. And then on any of the other visualizations, if you hover over, it will provide that uh, estimated total as well as the percentage there. We also have the ability to toggle between chart and table view of the data. So if you wanted to see those exact numbers, you have the ability to do so. So that it'll bring in um, the, the table and you can see those exact estimates rather than simply just the percentages here. And then finally, I wanted to point out um, the ability to hide and to show the margin of error. So for many of you who use census and other population data, you know that there's a margin of error um, for calculating these estimates. And so we've built in the ability to display that within our dashboard here. Um, we do realize that it's not gonna be important for everyone. And so we also have the ability to hide it for, for those who, who maybe wouldn't be using that. Uh, but basically if that's selected, it just brings in an extra uh, le level of, uh, or extra layer of, uh, of that for, for all of the charts and the visualizations. And so um, like for our tables, it'll bring in an extra column um, highlighting that margin of error there. So as mentioned, uh, we worked really closely with our, our local community organizations and those doing community assessment work to be able to understand the types of data that they need. Uh, for example, there's a local organization called Communities for Kids in Nebraska that creates short uh, one-page community assessment profiles to help understand the need for early childhood services within specific communities. Um, so previously, they, you know, they'd be going to several different websites um, to be able to attain these numbers that they need. And so we worked really closely with them to be able to reproduce that information directly on, on this page of the dashboard. 
Um, I also wanted to point out that recently we made the change to presenting the numbers on these charts on the first page as percentages of the total. So prior, we were just presenting the raw numbers, um, but we think the change to the percentages just helps provide a little bit more targeted, useful information for our stakeholders. Um, again, we still have the ability to see those raw numbers by, by either using that hover over feature or um, looking at the table view of the data. All right, so I'm going to move on to the second page of our dashboard, and that's eligibility population indicators. So um, this page brings in some additional population indicators and tables from the census data. Um, I did want to point out that those selected filters do carry forward from that first page. So um, we have Lancaster County highlighted, and it's still being, being uh, shown on this page here. You can still clear that out by hitting the little eraser button above. We do have the same two filters then of years and geography included on this page with the same slices of geography as, as on that first page. And then the third filter is for the different population indicators. So for this, um, we did choose population indicators and, and start with ones that were freely available on the census.gov website for all of the counties in Nebraska. And that was a little bit tricky because Nebraska is such a rural state. And so there's very small county numbers. And so we were a little bit limited in the types of stuff that, that we could present here. But um, we did some mapping and these were the ones that um, we actually could provide for all of the different counties in Nebraska. So then basically for the population indicator that you have selected, it will display below the percentage of people of each racial and ethnic group that fit that indicator. Um, and again, we have the state of Nebraska on the left-hand side and that selected geography on the right-hand side here. So this way of presenting the data was something that we consistently heard from our stakeholders how they really wanted the ability to be able to break the data down by race and ethnicity um, to help get at things like equity issues and then those kinds of things. Um, and then eventually we do hope to expand these population indicators to, um, you know, include more tables from, from the census website, um, as well as other indicators like how many children are experiencing homelessness, are in foster care, etc. So just, um, you know, more specific information, population level information that our stakeholders would like to know. All right, so I don't have time uh, to go over the last two pages of the dashboard, but just kind of wanted to fill in a little bit of information um, just to help kind of understand the, the full scope of our dashboard. Um, so the third page access, just really briefly, provides a location of all of our various child care providers within our state. Um, and it includes a breakdown by step up to quality rating. Uh, step up to quality is our state's uh, quality rating and improvement system, as well as a breakdown by if they accept subsidy or not. And so the data in this tab can help support decisions related to outreach and program improvement and can help with um, equity issues and other things like that. And then our final page is the services tab. Um, and so this tab provides data on services and programs that children are participating in. And so if you're familiar with the, the distinct count that Missy mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, that's where this data lives. And it provides also provides a little bit of profile on the children that are actually participating in these programs. And so together, uh, this dashboard uh, organized again with the, with the easy framework is it has become really a one stop shop for most of the data that our stakeholders need or are interested in. And, and while the backbone of our dashboard is really that state administrative data, uh, the census data can really help us fill in the gaps and provide a, a more complete uh, picture and estimates um, of, of, the, uh, of everything that's going on in our state for our stakeholders, um, and especially within those eligibility pages and the use of that census data. All right, so that's everything I have. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Ross from 3SI. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning slash afternoon. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about um, CUSP Public, and I'm gonna explain exactly what that is in here in a minute. My name is Ross Gilliland. I'm the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships at 3SI, which is Third Sector uh, Intelligence. Um, just uh, by way of overview, we're gonna first give some context about what, like how this tool came to be, and then we're gonna show you screenshots from the tool, which is still in development. Um, and then sort of talk about next steps. So it's kind of like where Cus Public has come from, where it is now, and where it's going. Um, and before I go into all the detail, I guess I just want to say, like, I, I am a self-identified fanboy of census data. Like, I use it all the time and, like, you know, wouldn't be here if, if we didn't use it and love it. Um, in our discussions with states, we find that invariably the data that states need 
as not readily accessible um, or available in some of the some of the tables that are available through things like the American Community Survey. And so really like a huge amount of our work has been to um, find ways to add value to those data to make them readily usable. Um, okay, so a, a bit about 3SI. So 3SI again, third sector intelligence, we're a software company. You might be wondering why a software company is here on the phone with you. Um, in, the, in this case, it's because uh, we have developed an ESID solution, um, so-called CUSP, or the Child Universal Success Platform. We have developed a software-based ESID solution. So that's what CUSP is. And, and you'll hear us refer to CUSP versus CUSP Public. So like CUSP is the full meal deal ESID solution. And the Gates Foundation has funded 3SI to basically carve out what um, we would call a public good from CUSP, um, which is what we're calling CUSP Public. Um, and so it's going to be freely available to anyone, states, et cetera, who would like to access the data in CUSP Public. Um, we also want to just note that we're leveraging some foundational work that ACF had done and engaging with states about some of their, their needs from tools like this. Um, okay, so again, sort of from like where, where we've come from, um, CUSP, the ESID solution CUSP it, right now is implemented in five states. Um, representing about 20% of the child population, zero to five. Um, 3SI has also done sort of like ESIDs prep work with those two states that you see highlighted there. And then we've we've done some form of technical assistance in early childhood data for roughly 15 or more additional states on top of all of that. Um, so really the, the point being is like, there's a lot of experience um, that we are, have sort of brought to develop this tool and make it as sort of targeted as possible to the needs that states would would have. Um, in terms of the tool itself, I, I, again, I guess we just want to make the point that um, CUSP is sort of pressure tested out in the real world. It's used every day by those states that are um, implementing it as an ESID solution. And you can sort of see that blue box there. It's really just the first link in a long chain of um, different things. But you know, we, we model the entire child population. We'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, but then after that, there's all of the things that you would expect from an ESIDs, right, in terms of bringing in administrative data, et cetera. Um, and we actually find ways to kind of like match up the population data with the, with the, the administrative data. So it's sort of like a seamless experience. Um, but importantly, and I, 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 the highlight in orange at the end is, is showing really, again, as a sof software as a service solution, this is something that is going to be, um, you know, kind of continually developed and improved upon over time. So um, just like you would get like pesky Windows updates or whatever it is, you know, like they get pushed out. Like we do the same thing, hopefully less peskily, um, whereas we we update the software, make enhancements to the to the platform. And so the, the same will be true of CUSP public, even if it is somewhat of a carve out from the full CUSP solution. Um, so I do want to say again, the blue box, it's, you know, it's a sort of small slice of this full full thing, but it gets at some very specific use cases. So um, these use cases, 3SI kind of already had these um, on our radar, to be honest, and we've we've worked with a lot of states and, and these are very common use cases and ACF um, very much validated that, um, that these use cases are gonna be relevant to states as well. So just to briefly walk you through them, um, the, the first one is around establishing a quality denominator, air quotes, and what we mean by that in terms of establishing program uptake is, um, you know, a state could, uh, with their own administrative data, know how many children they're serving. But if they want to know, like, if they're serving 10,000 kids, is that a lot? Is it a little? Um, you kind of need to know how many kids you could or should be serving. And that's what we mean by the denominator is like looking at the full population and just sort of establishing that clearly um, and potentially doing that for different programs, right? And there's different populations that would be eligible for those programs. Um, and then the second, the second is around um, scenario modeling. And in this case, looking at the existing um, as existing population that might be eligible for a program and then sort of doing what if analysis, like if we were to make adjustments to policy, et cetera, how would that affect different communities across the state? And so we'll give some very concrete examples of what that looks like. Okay, um, so with that, that's, that's all the preamble. That's where we've been. And now let's look at the tool itself. So first to talk about some of the data that's in the tool. Um, it, it pains me. You must know it pains me that I can't spend more time talking about the methodology of this. It would be a fun conversation. So I'll, 
it, in an absolute nutshell, like a nutshell that's floating in the stratosphere, very, very high level, we add value to census data by using ACS output tables, a number of them, as well as the, the public use microdata. Um, and we do that to infer levels of granularity that are lower than what's natively available in ACS, um, and also to model the interaction between terms. And so what that means is like, if you were to go straight to ACS today, you could get household income, great. You could get um, child age, you could get parent labor force participation, but they'd be in separate tables. Um, and so we, because uh, states need this, we are modeling the, the specific interaction between between those sort of um, otherwise separate dimensions. So um, anyway, that's a that's a major difference. And we we have um, prioritized the dimensions that you see here at the top. So child age, household income, both as a percentage of the poverty level as well as state median income, um, parent labor force participation, and then of course like the location of the child. And right now, uh, CUSP public models at the county level, but just know that the full CUSP model aggregates to all other types of geographic units. Um, so, uh, there are other, there's other information that, of course, will be useful to states. And, um, you know, we, we know that uh, programmatic eligibility could, um, is quite complex. And so we've just sort of prioritized like the broadest brush strokes of, of these. Um, some of the other information that states have asked for, we're also including in the tool, it's just not modeled down at the child level the same way. So you'll see um, a brief example of, of child race ethnicity data that can be used as kind of an overlay analytically. Um, and then in the future, possibly add some other um, types of data as well. Okay, so here's just a very brief screenshot of the first page. You can see the full nation, everything's at the state level. We'll drill down in a second. Um, but the, the three tabs, you sort of see a blue box at the top and the three tabs are population, program eligibility and scenario analysis. So those first two tabs tie to the first use case around establishing the, the denominator of the total child population. And so the child population is fairly self-explanatory. Again, it allows us to segment the population by different characteristics. The program eligibility tab is really just mapping that population based on those characteristics to specific program eligibility requirements. Um, and then the scenario analysis is just that like what if analysis. So um, diving in first to the child population tab, you know, you'll see the full child population zero to 12, all your filters are here up the top. Um, and there's some very, very high level summary statistics here. But if we wanted, we can drill down. So quite arbitrarily, I have selected the state of Georgia um, and we can drill down even further. So like you see this cluster, dark green cluster here, that that's actually um, like the Atlanta metro area. And so what we've done here then is like select some, some of these filters. And so um, just by way of an example, we've taken the population that's above 100% FPL, below 50% SMI with working parents, infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Um, you know, this is just a hypothet hypothetical example, but the reason why someone might do something like that is if they wanted to see, like, the population that's not eligible for Head Start but is for um, subsidy child care, you know, that, that type of thing. Anyway, there's a fair amount of flexibility and power with the tool. Um, in terms of the program eligibility, um, again, we were mapping the same underlying data, but just to actual programs that um, that might be serving the children. Right now, we're including CCDF funded child care and Head Start and Early Head Start. But um, again, the full CUSP model would include all kinds of other programs and we will probably include others um, going forward, things like public pre-K, et cetera. Um, we've just sort of started with this initial set. Um, and I'm going to go to the next page just to show you kind of like some of the summary stats here. So again, you can filter that eligible population however you want. Um, over at the right, you see some helpful summary stats like the total population eligible for each program individually. And then down here at the bottom is sort of a combined intersection of the population that's eligible for any funded program versus no funded programs. Um, so we can kind of look at that um, overlap as well. And then finally, moving on to scenario analysis. Um, so again, for this, we, we kind of define what we call a baseline or like a status quo scenario and then the modeled scenario. And so, you know, we could look, um, I'll just look hypothetically, if we were to increase the, the income eligibility threshold in Georgia and what would that look like? So I took that same population, it's like above 100% FPL, but below 50 SMI, um, working parents, et cetera, et cetera. 
and then say, well, what would happen if we were to raise the income threshold from 50% SMI to 60% SMI? Okay, so that goes up. So you'd expect there to be more kids, but what's the delta? What does it look like across the state? Um, so that's that's what you see here. Um, and I'll, yeah, so you can see the total eligible on, on both scenarios, but also what's the delta? What's the percent change? You can see it by county right now in this map. Um, you could also see it by um, just bar chart. Like not everybody likes a map. So if you want to see it here, we have the exact same information by county and it's just rank ordered in terms of the, the number increase. You could toggle between numbers and percents if you want. Um, and then lastly, and again, it, it pains me that I can't spend more time on this, but this is a, just an example of how some of the race ethnicity data um, can kind of be overlaid. So you'd see this, it's really all the same information in terms of the, the change in eligibility for each county, but now each county is a dot on this map. And then what basically the user is able to select um, like a multi-select, so any, any number of different race and eth ethnic categories, and then see the percent composition within each of those counties of those selected races and ethnicities. Um, and so it, in theory, it could allow someone to see if they're gonna make a policy change, is this gonna really disproportionately impact certain communities over others? Um, so I, again, can't go into a lot of detail there, but um, happy to talk about it later. Okay, so having walked through the tool, we'll just sort of explain very briefly kind of where we are, uh, you know, kind of where we're going with this. Um, so when we release the, the tool, ultimately, we're going to have documentation on the methodology. Um, there's, there's a lot to say there. And some of just some of the limitations of, of, the, of the tool and also the underlying error in the census data that's feeding the tool. Um, and then importantly, I should um, probably have this in blinking lights because a lot of people will care about this, but we'll make the raw data just available for download. So. Um, there'll be, you know, just like CSV type download, either for a state or for the whole nation, um, again, freely available. Um, and then there's going to be additional enhancements that we'll, we'll layer in here as well. Um, and then in terms of development stage, so, you know, again, we're talking to all of you today for these sort of like early discussions, and then we're going to have a, what we would call a closed alpha in December, uh, where we actually walk through the tool with some states. Um, and then Q1 of next year is when we're going to actually, that'll be like the open beta, the launch of CUSP public. Um, and I think, of course, we'll we'll continue to get input and um, kind of improve the, the tool over time. But some of the early input that we'll be layering in is, um, you know, certainly how to communicate the usefulness, the limitations, et cetera, of the tool, how to optimize the user experience to make sure that it's really intuitive for states um, and just make sure that states ultimately find this, you know, useful and want to use it. Um, so that is it for now, um, and we're happy to answer any questions later, and you can feel free to reach out to us directly if you'd like. So again, I'm Ross Gilliland, and then I have several colleagues. Um, you can reach out to Will, and also some several of my colleagues are on the phone today as well. Um, also, you know, feel free to go to our website. That's where the tool will ultimately be hosted. It's on team3si.com, or you can follow us, um, get a hold of us if you want updates, talk to us, or just um, follow us on LinkedIn if you want to see some of those updates. That's it. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Joe. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, uh, everybody hear me? Yes? We good? Okay. Um, Having listened now to the, to the three presentations, um, I have a number of comments because I'm I am kind of a, a bit, I've been asked. Joe, to do this, this is Allie. Yeah. Just real quick, you might want to switch over to your presenter view real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no problem. Just no. didn't want you to go too far. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, many people on this uh, on this webinar are using data from the American Community Survey. And a lot of the ACS data is, of course, hooked to the decennial census. Um, what I am here, why I'm here today, is to talk about um, the quality of the data in the decennial census on young children, specifically children uh, under five. And it's been studied a lot. Um, there is a team now at UVA, University of Virginia, um, and uh, you see on the screen here, the members of our team, and I'm here representing us today. Um, we are working with the Census Bureau um, 
to improve the counts of young children, which many of you have heard about today. The census data is all over, and for good reason. It's the best source of small area data. My previous life, I worked as the chief demographer for New York City for several decades, and I know the value of small area data for program work. Um, I, I know it very well. Um, so what I want to do here today is kind of turn things, <laughs> turn, turn this whole thing on its head, so to speak. I want to describe the problem um, of undercount among young children in the decennial census and uh, talk a little bit about the implications for the American Community Survey. Secondly, introduce you to the curated data enterprise, which is an approach that the Census Bureau is adopting as part of their overall enterprise effort. I want to describe how that curated data enterprise or CDE permits the development of products using data from multiple sources. You just heard Ross talk a little bit about this. Um, and I'm interested in, in uh, very interested in that. Certainly. Um, and I want to explore how local administrative records can be used to create better counts of young children. Again, kind of turning everything on its head because the locals have a lot of knowledge regarding who is actually on the ground. Now let's start with the basics. If you look at the decennial census and the 2020 census, and you look at what the Census Bureau has created, they're called coverage rates. Um, some people refer to them as uh, rates of undercount or overcount. You see here that young children had the largest net undercount of any age group in the 2020 census. Now, let me say at the outset that the Census Bureau created these estimates and they know full well about this. And they're taking steps in order to compensate for this in their population estimates, which drive the American Community Survey data uh, that is being used and is being displayed today in these, in these presentations. But it, it's important to note that this adjustment, uh, this 5.4% uh, net undercount adjustment is being applied equally all over the nation. All right. Um, and there are implications here because some parts of the nation obviously have a more serious net undercount problem than other places. For example, concentrations of young Hispanic, Black, and American Indian children have a much more serious problem than the overall average would indicate. Now, many of you probably know this the net undercount problem among young children has gotten more serious over time relative to other age groups. So in this chart, you see the pop 18 and over, and you see the uh, population under five, and you see that net undercount has gotten worse over the decades. Um, it is a, a serious problem. And frankly, uh, many of you know, having worked in the, the census and sure in the field, know, uh, that outreach is very, very important. But one of the things that I think we need to come to terms with is that outreach by itself is not sufficient to solve this problem. The Census Bureau needs to create, a, it needs to be more creative in its use of administrative data. And that's what I'm here to talk about. What has the Census Bureau been doing? Um, I, let me say this. I don't have to tell any of you on this webinar today about this chart. You know, there's a lot of money riding on this. Uh, I have a quick anecdote. <clears throat> when I was in New York, uh, so, uh, we would use percentages. We would talk about the percentage of children by neighborhood in the city. And what we quickly realized is that percentages don't matter. It's the number of kids who need childcare. It's the number of kids that need a service. Absolute numbers matter. Absolute numbers matter in the distribution of dollars which is huge, um, early childhood and for all children, you see a listing of the programs here. And by the way, I'll make these slides available after the talk. All right, so the Census Bureau is reacting to all of this in the form of their enterprise efforts. Um, they are, you see here, this is a quote from Robert Santos, who's the uh, director of the Census Bureau, who said that the Bureau is headed towards what we call a single enterprise data centric operation, kind of like a uh, an interesting way of saying that we're going to take all this data 
and we're going to bring it to bear on a particular product, a particular issue. We are going to make products the kind of the, the focus, the focus first, statistical products first is what they've called it. They're shifting kind of the, the what we call shifting the paradigm. In essence, um, the way you think about a survey, you think about the American Community Survey, right? And the American Community Survey has all this output and the Bureau puts all this stuff out there and then uh, Ross and other people and uh, people you've heard from today, take it, put it in on platforms to make it usable for people so that they can combine the numbers, so to speak, in a way that makes sense for them. Well, the Census Bureau is saying, well, wait a minute. If we have, if we put the product first and we ask ourselves, what survey data, what ACS data, what census data, what administrative data could be used to optimal, to create a product that's optimal for the purpose that's been outlined by the user community. So what does this mean? It means that you consider the count of young children as a product, okay? And in this case, a 2030 census product, let's say, all right? And the focus is on a product and what data you need to optimize the quality of that product. In other words, what does the Census Bureau possess and what do they need to get in order to create a good product? So. It, these can be seen as a supplement to the census enumeration. The Bureau has already used administrative data in the 2020 census. So this is what we call the CDE or the Curated Data Enterprise. It's a fancy way of saying we put purpose and use uh, kind of first, and then we have all these things that we do, these research activities involving what we call data discovery. In other words, what's out there. We ingest the data. We develop statistics, we look, we wrangle the data and look at its fitness for use, for purpose. And then we take into consideration on the outer band you see in blue, how do we communicate it? What kinds of engagement we want with stakeholders? How do we curate it? What are the eth ethics uh, and equity considerations? What about privacy and confidentiality? What platforms do we use? So where does this take us? We are in the early stages of identifying states that possess records with sufficient information for matching purposes. What does that mean? I'll explain. Within the ECID system, there's data that the Census Bureau might be able to use to improve the counts of young children. If states are willing to work with the Census Bureau to do this, uh, states perhaps that we refer to as states that are being ready or have a high degree of readiness or states that already reach out um, to the research community and offer opportunities to look at their records. Um, this is an area that within UVA, again, in concert with the Census Bureau that we've been, we've been looking at. Now, the idea is to enhance what the Census Bureau calls the demographic frame. The Census Bureau actually has a data set that they are creating, a frame, one of several frames um, that contain demographic characteristics. They're building this and addresses associated with every person in the US that they could pull together from all these data sources. They use third party data, they use census data, survey data. Um, they use these what are called personal identification, uh, person level identification, uh, um, numbers, uh, if you will, person level identifiers. Uh, they call them PICS, personal identification keys. Um, and they link information for individuals this way. Uh, it's an internal project. Um, it's not something that's that they are kind of, the, the data is not certainly being put on the outside, so to speak. But the Bureau is working to create this frame. OK, and you see the circle I have in the lower right corner because I wanted to emphasize that part of that frame involves state data, but it involves data from the IRS, data from all kinds of sources uh, that they are pulling together. <clears throat> they engage in discovery. They're looking for records, in this case, of young children uh, from the states. <clears throat> they, each one of those steps that I showed you earlier has a role here. Um, it's being done behind the Census Bureau's firewall. Um, they are wrangling the data 
evaluating the capacity of the data to inform this, uh, uh, this demographic frame, as we call it. And the question is, if you bring the data in, does it enhance the demographic frame? Now, let me get something straight right off the bat. We know, and everybody on this webinar knows, that you cannot get a full uh, accounting of the entire ch child population, the uh, population of, of kids under the age of five from local records. It, it's virtually impossible. You know that, all right? Full coverage, as we call it in demography, is not likely to be achieved that way, all right? Not at all. And our early examination shows that clearly or when we look at ESIDS records versus the numbers in the census. But that's not the point. The point is that the programs at the state level that you administer, that you research, involve children who are vulnerable, the very children that get missed in the census and surveys. So maybe there's a piece of the puzzle that you possess that if the Census Bureau had it, they could improve their demographic frame. That's what this is all about. It's not about full coverage at the ESIDs within the state. It's about giving the Bureau data so that they can go ahead and they can enhance the counts of children. Again, thinking about 2030 is not output from the census, okay? But as uh, 2030 as a product for children that involves not only the census, but perhaps other data sets that the Bureau has been able to bring in and verify. Now, uh, let me say, <laughs> that um, <clears throat> we have put together a use case. Um, this is the citation for that use case. It is up in the UVA repository for uh, examination. It is a full you know, explanation of what this is all about, a full discussion of how we came to this point where we are looking at various states in order to consider partnering, uh, uh, consider partnerships with some states in order to evaluate whether the records you possess can make for a better count, which would then be brought back to you in the form of better census and ACS data. So I'm just putting this out there, not for discussion right now, but these are the general questions we're asking. How well do those local records in an ESIDS or SLDS account for all children or more selectively for subgroups missed in the count? That's it, subgroups missed in the count. What would it take for states to share a sample of records with either UVA or ultimately with the Census Bureau for research purposes? How can state collaborators participate in the activity I'm describing? And are there currently data sharing agreements that we should consider at UVA in order to make this, make this happen? Um, I thank you. These are uh, it's my contact information. And the leader of our team is Stephanie Ship at UVA. Um, and I encourage you to contact us with any questions you might have. But thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Missy. Thanks, John. Thanks to everybody who's presenting. I'm going to really, I think what we've heard is had a really good opportunity to talk a little bit about how the states are presenting and talking a little bit about this and how they've used the current data. It's been good to see that there's a lot of focus specifically on how we use this for community assessments, which again, drives a lot of the work in early childhood. And that has been the way the decisions are being made. Ali, are the slides being shared? Okay, that looks different on my screen. Yeah, they look good, Missy. Okay. Um, so with that, you know, so again, I think thank the panelists for sharing their current solutions, the challenges that they have faced getting to where they are. Um, it, it both shows where we have come as a field. And even five years ago, I think we had very limited community assessment data at the state level, despite the fact that almost all of our programs in early childhood need that information for program planning and, and program justification for many cases as they write their grants. Um, we've known for a very long time the limitations of the undercount, and so I, I appreciate Joe sharing that they are trying to find solutions that will help address this particular need. Um, and, and I really appreciate the, the tools that are being created both by the states and, and vendors like 3SI to really look at how are we integrating this data better, how are we addressing some of these gaps, knowing that both it's a costly process, right, as Jen mentioned, they bought the data. 
right? Like how how is that happening, especially with states who have limited resources? So it's both, I think, a nice opportunity to kind of reflect that we have made progress as a field with some of these tools and to also think about the future potential and, and things to the states and the 3SI for thinking, looking about this kind of predictability forecasting option. We know that that's going to be really tricky, but as mentioned from ACF and other partners, that is a really important need as we think about the scenarios, as we think about program expansion, where we're going to need teachers, the, the, the field as we're kind of evolving, what that's going to look like, knowing that that is changing significantly. Um, and we have been dependent upon a lot of the ACS data historically, and now so better understanding about the limitations and the potential, I think is really helpful. So really excited to see where this goes as we continue forward. Uh, so thank you all for sharing that. I think, again, hopefully for others, that gives us a chance to understand where the field has been and where it's going. But what I want to do is uh, we, we've posed a couple questions that I'm hoping some of our panelists can talk to. Um, and then I'm, there are some Q&A questions. So those who are joining us today, please go ahead and start um, entering your questions in Q&A, and we will come back to those after we get through these panel questions to get the conversation started. So please feel free to, to jump in there. Uh, but my first question for the panel is, it really kind of focuses on why do we need the census data, right? Especially if we knew the limitations, I'm gonna ask the hard question, like why are we working so hard to get this? Is there another way to do this? So what is the census data giving us from a population perspective that we can't get somewhere else? So I'll just turn that over to the panel. What do y'all think? So Missy, for us in Minnesota, uh, I mean, we were working with our Head Start partners and they said, this is something that we need that we just can't get. Um, and so that was where we kind of did a scan to see where we might be able to get that information. And of course it was ACS. Um, but I'm also thinking about like our school districts who are required to do their own birth to four census to get a sense of um, how many kids might be coming into their schools in the future. And so they're um, assigned to work with partners in their local area. So of course, getting birth records and also working um, with uh, doctor's offices and working with, you know, like just anybody who can help them get a sense of like a good count of how many kids from uh, age zero from birth up to four um, they could be expecting. And so it's a it's kind of an impossible task. And without um, some sort of foundational idea of how many people it or how many kids it should be, um, you kind of don't even really know what you're you're shooting for, what you're aiming for. And if you're, what you put together in your own local census was anywhere close to what it should be or could be. Um, so we really do rely on the census data just to give us some sort of benchmark, whether it's off by a bit, by 5%, or it's right on, at least we have a, an idea of how many people are in our area. And I'm, I'm happy to add onto that. I think for 3SI and the states that we work with, um, we find that the questions around programmatic eligibility are really important and um, yeah, it's virtually impossible to get any kind of full coverage with like local administrative data as Joe was kind of underscoring earlier. Um, so e even the states that we've worked with that have like really good integration of um, like vital records data and immunizations and all those other things that you would think would have a lot of kids in them, there's always some kids that are gonna be left out, um, number one. So like it could be kids that like moved into the state or something like that, um, but on top of that, and much more prevalently, I guess I'd say there's, um, you know, all of the characteristics that would denote programmatic eligibility around household income, et cetera, et cetera. Like it would be, a, it's hard to get reliable information on that. And if it's coming from like a birth record, it could be, you know, years out of date, that sort of thing. So um, that's that's a big reason why we've we've ultimately leaned as we have on on the census data it seems to really be like the ultimate place to to be able to get such breadth of all of that information um, in order to inform you know sort of the the complex picture of programmatic eligibility um you have this landscape of you know in some cases dozens of different programs serving kids and so you really need to know a lot to understand which levers might be available to reach certain populations Great. 
Thank you both. That's that's helpful to understand both from a kind of national perspective, Ross, and, and Jen from like more of a state perspective, really trying to help the help your local programs. And so it's great to understand where that limitation is and have not having that population, but also the limitations of it sounds like Ross combining it with other data that we need for program eligibility is really important. So thank you. The second question is. Why? So why is the ECIDS really highlighting these issues? So what is it that's new, right? The, the census obviously is not new. Um, so what about it, the ECIDS is highlighting these particular issues? And I think Jared, you had mentioned some of this, so maybe we'll start with you, because I think this came up in some of the, the presentation you had said. Yeah, yeah, definitely, Misty. Um, so, so in working with census data, I think, you know, first off, we realized that, that when we were relying solely on administrative data, there were a lot of gaps in our data. Um, we weren't getting the full picture of what was going on within early childhood. And so that's when we started pulling in the census data. It really helped fill in those gaps and create a, a you know broader picture of the population than we've really ever had in Nebraska. Uh, when everything was siloed, you know, there was really no reference point for what the numbers should be in our state. Um, but, you know, when we started pulling in in the census data and, and the more we worked with it, um, we realized we did realize that, you know, that the most recent estimates, um, like what Joe was talking about, are undercounted. And so, you know, this is a really big deal for us, obviously, um, when we rely on this data for, for things like program expansion, for, for targeting extra services. Um, you know, this is obviously a big deal. And so we want these estimates to be as accurate as possible. And so, um, you know, I think what we've learned is that working closely with the Census Bureau moving forward, trying to obtain better estimates. Or, or making adjustments um, will be really important. And then I also just want to point out that, you know, in a rural state like Nebraska, um, we, we need estimates for counties or locations that often have, you know, very, very small populations. I mean, some of our counties have, you know, less than 500 people. And so um, obviously when using census data, you know, those aren't going to be super accurate in those counties anyways. And so, um, you know, if, if we're relying on these estimates, again, it, it's just really important that they're as accurate as possible. And so um, I, I think that's what we learned. That's the biggest thing we learned is moving forward just to, to work with the, the Bureau um, and then try to get, you know, better estimates for these sorts of things. Yeah, I, I, I would encourage, based on, on what Jared just said in, in Ross's presentation, I would encourage people to engage in the use of ranges especially for budgetary purposes, um, you consider uh, the number of kids, you, let, let's face it, the census, and what, what we mean here is the American Community Survey, essentially, um, it's the only source of small area data. I mean, there is nothing else um, that could claim, uh, even though we know it's short, could claim representativeness, all right? So it's the best estimate we have of who's actually out there who might be eligible for a program where we want a, a denominator for a rate, a health, you know, uh, perhaps, a, you know, for public health purposes, for example. Um, so we have that, but we also know there are limitations. So what I would hope people would consider is when you use a number, build a range around. Um, I guess what we call it a sensitivity analysis. Uh, um, build a range. Uh, in the Minnesota presentation, Jen, I noticed you included standard errors. So you, you included, uh, you know, errors. And you could use those to build a range where you would say, this is my estimate of how much it would cost to field this program on the low end and on the high end. And in essence, you're, you're building in a comfort zone that not only takes into account, in this case, uh, sampling error as with the ACS, um, but uh, on top of it, you could, you could actually, I believe, argue that um, the, the value is, lies somewhere in that range. And that it, it takes into account maybe some of the other things that um, that are, you know are, that I talked about. Um, again, not to, you want to build something perhaps not totally based on sampling variability, but also uh, something that uh, uh, gives people a sense of what the range might be of of, of the numbers. That's helpful. And I, I like the idea of thinking about how we display the data differently, especially given the limitations that we know, what that might look like, and as we merge it with other data, <laughs> what, what we need to be aware of as well. Uh, so that's helpful. Thank you both for doing that. And then and then our my final question before we jump into the Q&A is what would it look like if we could use an ECIDS to understand which children are being served, right? So there's an implied assumption that this is what the ECIDS is going to help us do. But what would it look like if we're going to be successful in doing this? So, 
Yeah, I think I'll I'll jump in here. I'm crashing the party a little bit. Hi everyone. I'm Chris Trust Clark, CEO of of 3SI. And and I, I think that's a great question. Um the core a core mission of 3SI is to really help governments optimize how uh how they reach, serve, and ultimately improve really its outcomes for young children and and particularly uh low income and and vulnerable populations and and that's one of the reasons why we're really committed uh along with the gates foundation to put out cuss public for free is because we really believe in that uh as a company and but most more importantly that's what our you know states that we work with believe in and and i think uh in particular uh a component to that question also is to also just understand not just the children that you're serving and trying to help, but uh, as was a common theme throughout this webinar is those children who are eligible for services but are not being reached. And then to help optimize resources to, to know and to, to get to and to, to reach and serve as many of those children as possible with the funds that you've got available because, you know, they're, they're scarce funds and so you want to optimize it. And that's why I, you know, an ESIDS is so critical. And that's why population data within the ESIDS is even more critical because you've got to have the context. If you have an access desert and you're only saying serving, for example, 10% of the population, you got to figure out how to how to get to those, you know, other 90, 90% of those kids in that town. And so I we really, really believe in it. Uh, our states believe in it. You know, pretty much everybody I think in the field believes it, but it's 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 worth it to, to emphasize. Uh, so thanks. Um, and I think too, if you remember back to Joe's presentation and he had that slide where he was showing how much money had been invested um, in these early care and education programs over the course of a number of years and how after the pandemic, it just jumped significantly, um, like more than doubled. And I think that that, terrible circumstance just really um, shined a light on where many of our resources should be going. Um, and people just maybe were not realizing it for some reason before, but we all know it. Um, and so I think too that we could leverage information from ESIDs in order to um, have our decision makers, our policy makers recognize, yes, we are serving this many kids, this many kids are eligible but are not being served. We need to put even more funding into these programs to give the kids the best start that they have. Um, so that is my hope for our ESIDs that eventually we'll be able to influence policy in a positive way to impact kids and families' lives. Yeah, so I can jump in here. Um, so, so really, I mean, honestly, the understanding which children are being served is actually like our explicit goal of our eKids. That's something in Nebraska that we've we've never been able to accomplish. Um, and, and so, um, you know, we as a state just want to understand how many children are being served um, and within early childhood and with what combination of services. And so understanding this information, or, you know, will really just give us a much more complete picture of the data, help us understand, you know, where we can target expansion, um, where, how we can better allocate our resources, how we can better, you know, improve the delivery of our programs and services. Um, I think down the line, I think also, you know, once we have this distinct count and, and understand, you know, which combination of services children are participating in, um, I, I think this will allow us to look at some longitudinal use cases, which again, we haven't been able to do in Nebraska. And so um, we'll be able to understand, you know, what's happening to children after they attend one of our programs or obtain a service um, and understand things like program in, uh, impact, um, get at things like funding, like Jen was talking about, um, and, and other things like return on investment. So we, we just haven't been able to do any of this. And so I think um, this will just open up, you know, a whole can of worms for us as far as um, what we can do with this data and, and, and all the exciting things we've been able to accomplish. All right. Well, that is fantastic. I'm going to turn us now to do some uh, some Q and A, if you don't mind, because there were a couple questions that came in. It would really be helpful. It sounds like a, kind of a group question for me is the update of this data in your systems. So, if there is a way that I think, in particular, Ross, Jared, and Jen, if you can just kind of quickly give us what what is the how how is this data being updated? What frequency? 
I, I'm happy to jump in. Yeah. So right now we have data, annual data from 2016 up through 2020, um, 2021, excuse me. And just as the census data is, are, are released, you know, it, it our population model is based entirely on the census data. So it just hinges entirely on when they release that. And usually like a month or two after that is when we would update the model. Yeah, and in Minnesota, we are buying five-year estimates, and we started with the 2006 to 2010, and then we purchased the 2011 to 2015, and 2016 to 2020. When the 2025 is available, we'll purchase that too. So we'll just keep going in five-year increments and then make sure that we're setting aside the pocket of money that we need in order to make those purchases. Yeah, and for us um, in our tool, currently we just have uh, 2021 census data. So we did just start with a, a one-time data dump of that year. Um, but we have had, you know, talks about increasing that in the future and hopefully, you know, including more years of data. Um, as far as programmatic data, um, we get updates kind of irregularly. It's just kind of um, like, for example, DHHS data for, for all of our um, licensed child care providers. Those are updated, um, I think, every two weeks or so. Um, we get like a rostering file and then we just kind of update our dashboard. Um, and then uh, data from NDE, I think, is just kind of updated uh, every year um, once we get the, uh, the, those numbers from, from our, our uh, NDE data system. Awesome. Thank you all. And, and there's a really good set of questions. I'm just going to kind of group all the questions around privacy together for a minute and we can get more specific and you all can follow it too if there's doesn't get fully addressed. But with the time, I want to make sure that... Some folks are asking, how is the privacy handled both in the purchasing of the data? So maybe that's directed at you first, Jen, and then kind of the both the display and the data sharing. So I'm kind of grouping a couple questions together. But if you all can talk a little bit about the, the privacy components, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So during my presentation, I think I mentioned we have data for almost all the counties and all the states and that um, the Census Bureau wouldn't um, give to us data at those um, you know, those smaller age bands for the smaller counties. Um, they have a, a data review board, I think it's called, um, and, and they consider all of these requests. And so they ultimately make the decision about what they're willing to, um, to share out with states. Um, so we just take that data that they are willing to give to us, the tables, and we put it into our tool. So we don't make any other determinations beyond what the data review board has made. So for three aside for uh, the the tool itself, we're we're just doing right now. Our first release is just at the county level, um, so there aren't as much I think privacy issues at the county level uh, um, from what we have experienced. But in terms of working with the states themselves with more sensitive data, we actually work uh, in each state government's cloud secure cloud environment where they allow us in. And then um, they actually control all of the security associated with, which is obviously very sensitive child level data. Um, and then what we do is we download our software into their environment and then run their data. So it never actually leaves their secure space, basically. Um, so that's how we that's how we handle uh, data security. And then data sharing is a whole whole another issue. And we can get into that if we have time, um, or or you can reach out to us, and we'd be happy to to answer that. All right, and then I wanna make sure we get to this kind of broader question here too, which is, there's a couple of questions that are coming up. I think it's really important to talk about equity. But so it's about the, how do we make sure we're both protecting, but also incorporating children with special needs, the racial perspectives on the different profiles that we have. Um, and, I love this question from when the how are we how might we decolonize the data? <laughs> and so we know that there's again yet another limitation in the census data, the way it's been collected and who's responding to it. And I don't know, Joe, if you don't mind starting us off here about how has that kind of historically been done? You you mentioned that there's the vulnerable populations are not often in it. So what what might be some strategies to think about that as states are considering ways to display it and use it using it for dis, uh, decision making? Well, um, first off, um, I would encourage. Um, Ross, uh, that when they create data um, um, through their modeling, um, whatever means uh, by race, um, that they um, look at the data against the local information that might have some detail that would allow them to determine whether um, the rates or whatever they're creating 
passed the smell test. Um, in, in New York, one of our big frustrations was um, we, uh, we had neighborhoods where our child inoculation rates were over 100%. Um, so we know immediately that um, the denominators are not right. So then the question is, well, where is the denominator? You know, what is it? And in the case of these neighborhoods, they were um, uh, black and Hispanic uh, neighborhoods. And we knew there was an undercount. Um, so we had to take it on ourselves to implement adjustments to the denominators because we, we couldn't publish a rate you know, of 110%, obviously. It's foolish. And our health department gets strangled because they can't figure out where to put the resources. Now, where are we missing kids? So this is where it becomes really important to be sensitive to this issue and to try to incorporate perhaps some sort of a some sort of adjustment um, that uh, that provides you with a hopefully a better a better denominator. But um, to get to to get to your main point, embedded in what you're doing are these differences in the data collection by race and Hispanic origin. We we know them. There are rates of of under uh, under enumeration net undercount that the Census Bureau publishes. And, um, and will continue to publish. Those need to be incorporated into the modeling and into some of your basic decision-making because some, someone said earlier, you know, that 5.4% may be fine in a whole bunch of counties in the Midwest, but may be awful in, in some of the counties with vulnerable populations. So if somehow you can tailor what you're doing to take that into account, I'm not, it's never gonna be perfect, but at least you're making an effort to do that and not pretending that just by blanketing a 5% you know, increase in a bunch of places is going to take care of the problem. So that would be my advice. That and trying to avoid, look, I worked for government a long time. I know everybody wants the number, okay? And it's <laughs> painful for people to say, well, it could be this or it could be that. And, and I, I know the pain of trying to do that. <clears throat> but if you say your budget, if your budget on the low end could be this and on the high end could be this, you know, and that person perhaps will pick the midpoint, but you're, you're doing a service by educating that person that you got to be careful you know, about where you try to place your resources. So, so that's the long of it, so to speak. <laughs> I just wanted to tag onto that. I mean, Joe, everything you said really resonates for us and certainly Years ago, when we started developing this model, we would see exactly the kind of thing you're talking about, like more kids served in subsidy than are estimated to even live in like a zip code or something like that. I think um, that approach has, um, or that eventuality has led to our um, current approach of, of really marrying um, the population estimates with administrative data. So it's, it's it's sort of kind of exactly what Joe's talking about, although we're com we're maybe coming from opposite ends and and meeting in the middle in a way because um, you know we've always uh, we're we're starting with census data and then figuring out how to enrich that with um, with some of these administ administrative data sets. and and what um, what happens when we're doing like the full cusp solution is that we reckon we basically reconcile to, address those exact issues. And we, um, again, can't get into a lot of details, but, you know, we're looking closely at like um, drive time, like the, or the travel distance to providers and things like that. And when we, when we simulate the sort of lower levels of granularity, we preserve overall population counts uh, whenever we can. But in some cases we end up having to say like, well, it's very likely that a lot of this population that's served is going to be served outside of this county or this zip code, that kind of thing. Um, and so I do think that there's a lot of power to kind of address the limitations of the data by 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 bringing these multiple data sources together. So I think we're very much philosophically aligned on that. And, and, and one of the things I want to encourage everyone, think about it as we would think of a heat map. Maybe you don't need to nail the exact numbers. It depends on your application. If you're doing a budget, obviously you're going to need number, an absolute number, right? But if you're trying to trying to send resources uh, into a particular uh, part of a state or, or a county even, um, maybe maybe the uh, uh, kind of a rough approximation would be sufficient in the form of a heat map. Let's say that this is the area you should focus on. 
uh, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe those tools, uh, you know, can serve the purpose in other words. Think about the ultimate end and think about what tools you need. Thank you. And I feel like this could be a whole new webinar that would come from this is like, how do we really think about how the data, both the limitations and the people that are represented in the census and what that means for us using this data for program policy making is significant. And like, I don't want to underestimate that or shortchange that on this webinar. Please know that that is a very, very important topic. And we are fortunate to have colleagues at UNC and at University of Pennsylvania at AISP, folks who really spend a lot of their time talking about this. So if this is something you want to follow up with us, please let us know. We will be happy to connect you. Um, and I do think that'd be a great future conversation about this is to really think about how the census data is, is, it, is it not, maybe is not serving the, the vulnerable populations we're really trying to target with an ECIDS and what the potential limitations are as we use the data for program policy making. But I do want to make sure as we wrap up today that we that you all as our audience know where you can continue to engage. This is an ongoing conversation, as you can tell. Um, and we hope that this gave you more things to think about, especially as you're developing ECIDS or if you're a researcher working with the state to do this, some things to consider. Um, but if you are interested in learning a little more about what the census is doing and how the, your ECIDS may in, help to inform that, that kind of bi-directional conversation happening, please follow up with Joe, um, who has been here and been very generous with his time today. Thank you for being here. Also, as, as the 3SI team presented, they are working on this public tool. They are currently in the development. So if you are interested in providing more conversations about either learning about their tool or the feedback on what they are creating, especially there were some questions about forecasting. So please, if you're one of those states, please reach out to Ross and let him know. We'll be happy to engage in that conversation with you. Um, and then Jen and Jared did a wonderful job of presenting their community assessment. There are other states who have also done something as well. So if you're interested in learning more, about really creating that use case around community assessments, please reach out to Ali. We'll happily connect you to both the references, the frameworks that Jared referenced, but the other tools that are being out there and being used because we wanna give you as many examples as possible. But with that, I really wanna thank you all for your time. Thank you to the panelists for being here, for being willing to share your information. Thank you for all the rest of you for joining and taking this time to learn. We will be posting this, um, this webinar. So if you wanna share this with colleagues, please feel free to do so. But thank you again to our panelists. I really appreciate you all sharing your, your wealth of information and expertise. Have a great day, everyone.